Oh, yes. Bullseye. Perfect shot. Bullseye. How's everybody doing tonight? Doing good? Good. So, starting a brand new series tonight called Bullseye. 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 And I told this story last week, but this, this is a, such a good series that we're, that we're about to go into. Such a good series that we're about to go into. But really quickly, I'll, really t- I'll retell this story. There's this story of uh, the 2008 Summer Olympics. This, this guy was a professional rifle shooter. And all week long, he had been competing. And he had done really well all week long, you know, trained his whole life for this. And he was last shot of the whole entire event. If he would have gotten like a 7.2 or higher, he would have uh, won gold medal. He aims, he fires, he shoots, he hits the bullseye, starts celebrating, realizes he hit the wrong target. He hit his opponent's bullseye. So his score was a zero, doesn't win gold, wins eighth place. So, so we're, whole, we're talking about tonight, we're starting this brand new series, Bullseye. And I plead with you, and I ask you this question. Do you know what you're aiming at? And do you know if it's the right thing you should be aiming at? Now, believe it or not, I don't know if you noticed or not, but momentum has things we're trying to accomplish. Um, and there's goals that we're trying to accomplish as a ministry. And we're aiming at targets, okay? Now, will we accomplish every goal? I don't know. It's yet to be seen. But we're making progress, and we're trying to hit the target. Now, I'll, I'll show you right now what momentum is, is currently trying to aim at. Go ahead and throw up our our thing that we're trying to do here. Okay, so this is, this we call this the, the building progress, okay? These are our goals. You can see we're trying to get 150 people at one service. The most we've had so far is 115. Uh, we're trying to get 50 people at house parties. We've had 30. Uh, we want 50% of momentum serving. We've reached that goal. We want to do nine outreaches in nine cities. We've done six. We want to see 150 first-time visitors. We've seen 109. Um, let's see here. We want to see 50 salvations. We've only seen 18. We want to raise some money for some missions trips. We haven't even tried to do that yet. And then, um, so that's why it's not accomplished. And then we want to have, on one post, 50 likes, 50 shares, and 50 retweets. And we did that already. So here is something that we are aiming at. We don't do this with just, we're not trying to stumble upon success. We're not trying to figure it out as we go. We're aiming at something and we're trying to accomplish it. We're trying to accomplish it. Um, we're, we're shooting for the stars. And if we land on the moon, we're pretty satisfied. And so do you know, do you know, do you know what you're aiming at in life? Do you know what you're aiming at in life? There's this really interesting story in the Bible out of Luke chapter 10. And it's about two ladies Martha and Mary, and Mary comes through town, Mary, Jesus comes through town in Luke chapter 10, and if you read the gospel of Luke, Jesus is always partying. Everywhere he goes, he's going to a party, one party the next. So he's walking into town, and he gets invited to another party, and it's over to Mary and Martha's house, and Jesus comes in, and he's teaching, and he's partying, and he's doing what we do. He's worshiping himself, and uh, <laughs> I'm just joking, and uh, so he's doing this thing, and, and Martha is busy is busy running around doing things. You're welcome. And uh, he's <laughs> running around doing things. And Martha gets frustrated because her partner in crime, Mary, Mary, her partner in crime, all she's doing is she's sitting on the front row listening to Jesus teach. And Martha gets very upset and tattletales on Mary and says, make Mary help me. And this are Jesus' words to her. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 10. Um, verse 41, it says this. Jesus says this. My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So Mary is hitting the bullseye, and Martha isn't hitting the bullseye. They're both with Jesus. They're both at the same event. They both have the exact same opportunity. But Mary is hitting the bullseye, and Martha has missed the bullseye. And so it tells me tonight that in this room, that there are people here who are hitting the bullseye. 
But then there's also people here with the same opportunity, the same kind of thing happening. You're missing the bullseye. And, and, and that kind of describes church in, re, in reality. Some people hit it, and some people don't hit it. And there's this great quote by Francis Chan, and it says this. We should, he says this, we should not be worried about being successful in life. He says we should be worried about being successful at the wrong things in life. Because you can waste time and energy on the wrong thing and hit it and succeed at it, but it's not good. At college, I watch kids do this all the time. Instead of going to class, they played video games. Instead of going to bed at night, they partied. And they failed out of college. They were succeeding at being number one at World of Warcraft. They were succeeding. They were. They were succeeding at partying and friendships. Oh, they were, the, they were the friendships everywhere. But they weren't hitting the right target. And we do that in life. And how tragic it is. How sad it is. And, 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 but tonight, all, we could change. We could fix this tonight. We can solve this problem. And, and here's, here's another thing. I want to just ask you a few questions. Are you, are you feel like you're kind of just going throughout your day? Do you feel like you're kind of going throughout your day, not aiming at anything, but hopefully succeeding? Does anybody feel like that? <laughs> that, that sometimes is me. Um, here's another question I have for you. How do you guide everyday small decisions in such a way that they eventually add up to a life that's sol solidly on target? I'll ask you that question again. How do you guide everyday small decisions in such a way that they eventually add up to a life that's solidly on target? Another question for you. How do you know what's driving your decisions every moment, whether you're aware of it or not? Because the truth is, it's actually difficult to live every single day with intense purpose. Few people live that way. You, and, and the ones who do, we marvel at. You, people who, business leaders, business icons, millionaires, billionaires, it seems like every decision they make is with purpose, intentionality, for creating success. And, and you think of like Steve Jobs or, or, or Bill Gates, you know, the Ford family, like, they've created icons. And, and, and it seems like every single decision they made, it was like because it had purpose. And, they, and it seems like they're aiming at a target and they're trying to hit it. And they might miss a few times, but at least they're aiming at the right target, right? Doesn't it seem like some people get it? And then it seems like the majority of us don't. Like, trust me, I've, I've been around long enough. I've watched many people live lives where it's, it's aimless. It seems as if... Their decisions are completely opposite day to day. <laughs> Has anybody ever encountered this? Where you talk to somebody one day and they're going to this school, and then you talk to them the next day and they're going to that school, and then you talk to them the next day, they're going back to the other school, and then you talk to them the next day, and now they're living in China. You're like, wow, you are amazing. But all over the place, I don't know if I can congratulate you on this. I'm more concerned than anything, but good job that you finally figured it out. I hope it's right, right? We're just, it feels like we're trying to figure it out, but it's hard to hit the target because we don't know where it's at. Am I talking to anybody right now? Amen. And, 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 and you're not alone. You're not alone. I bet you every single person here feels a little bit aimless. A little bit lost. I do. A little bit hoping that you're doing it right. Does anybody just feel like you're hoping you're doing it right? Is it just me? I don't want to preach alone tonight. Come on, people. Is it just, oh, I hope I'm doing it right. I want to be successful. How many people want to be successful? And, and, and you want it. You want money. And you want oh, boats, multiple boats, and lots of toys. And, and I want to do it. I hope I'm doing it right. I hope I'm doing it right. We're going to figure it out tonight. Uh, and I want to just start it off with this. In order, listen, in order to do this, in order to hit the bullseye, hit the right target, this is what you need to do. You ready? This is what you write down. 
This is it. This is the one sentence. I'll read it to make sure it's perfect. In order to do this, you need to know your values. What are your values? What are your values? Because we've done a lot of, I've done, I feel like I know other people's values, but I don't know my own. Like Rick Warren has three life values that he lives by. He preaches about them all the time. I know Rick Warren's values before I ever knew my own. That's so lame. And, and one of his values is generosity. And he lives by it. And part of that, he says, people are more important than possessions. He is generous. He wants to be generous. He doesn't care about the house in the Hamptons, the house in the hills. He rather give his money away because people are more valuable to him than possessions. No, listen, that's one of his values. What about you? What's your values? And tonight, before you go to sleep, I will challenge you for this. We're not going to give you time in service, but I want you to do this before you go to sleep tonight. I want you to just give it a thought. Think, what are three values for my life? I want you to think about this before you go to sleep. And I want you to write them down somewhere you can see them every single day. Now, I wrote my values down in my office. I have a big whiteboard in my office. It's like, it's like 12 feet by 5 feet. It's this big whiteboard. I got stuff all over it. In the top left corner, I have my, my three values that I live my life by. You want to know what they are? It's an, and it works out really well. I didn't even do this on purpose, but it's, an, it's a great acronym that I, that I do. I always tell, I tell myself, climb that hill. It's an acronym, H-I-L. And the first one is this, humility. Humility. I want to be a humble human being. You know why? Because I don't like prideful people. It, it turns me off. I don't like being around them. I like being around humble people. And I want to live a life of humility. And there's decisions that I make, small decisions that I make daily to ensure that I'm humble. Think about that. I'm aiming at that. Next one, H-I-L. I'd say climb that hill because it is a climb. It is hard. The next one is this, integrity. My character I care about my character. There's reasons why I care about my character. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But every day, I make decisions to have the right kind of integrity. What I live up here, I want that to be my private life too. I want to be able to rest my head on my pillow at night and, and, and be so at ease knowing I don't live a double life. Many of us live anxious lives because we live double lives. And I want to be able to rest and relax and say, ah, ah, my, my, I've, I've worked on my character today. I've worked on trying to be integrous with my life. And, and this is a, something that I pull the arrow back and I, I aim at it. I aim at it. And the last one is loyalty. I cherish loyalty within my family, within my secondary family, and in my friendships, and in my workplace, and in church, I cherish loyalty. And, and I want to be loyal to people. I want that. And I climb that hill. Humility, integrity, loyalty. These are three that I want to live by. I think about it all the time. I, I, when I make decisions, I say, does it line up with my core values? And so what are your core values? Look at what the Bible says in Mark chapter 13. It says, again, Jesus tells this little story. Go ahead, throw it up there. He says, again. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Now, this is just two verses, but let me practically break this down for you. There is a merchant. What is a merchant? It is a guy who d d dives into the sea and pulls up oysters and looks for pearls. He's a merchant. We see here we've got a, a merchant, a guy who dies for pearls. And, and, and he, God, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who, on the lookout for choice pearls. 
And, and then all of a sudden it says here that he's discovered a pearl of great value. So his entire life is finding pearls. He's looking for pearls. And, all, and I can just imagine this, right? He's got, his buddies are pearl, his merchants, you know, his buddies look for pearls. His buddies are treasure hunters too. And all of a sudden, you know, he comes up from a long day of pearl hunting and he gets up on shore and his buddy's like, Psst, bro, come over here. He's like, what? He walks over. He's like, his buddy's got something in the cloth. He's like, I found the greatest pearl ever today. And, th and this, this guy lives for pearls. He, he's knee-deep in pearls. His entire existence is pearls. And I'm sure he's heard this a hundred, if not a thousand times. I found the greatest pearl. And with a little bit of, you know, jadedness, he says, sure. Yeah, you did. Show it to me. So his friend starts peeling back the cloth. And, be, and under it is the greatest pearl he's ever seen. He gets so excited, so crazy freaking excited. This is, this is freaking crazy excited. He tells the guy, don't tell anybody in three days' time I'm going to buy that pearl. So he goes onto eBay and Auto Trader and Facebook Marketplace. He puts his house up for sale. He puts his cars up for sale. He puts his possessions up for sale. He sells his land. He sells everything he owns. And he finds his friend three days later and he gives this guy everything because this one pearl means so much to him. This guy has figured it out. This guy has searched for the greatest pearl in the world, and he finally found it, and when he discovered it, he sold everything he owned and bought it. This guy freaks out. And he has lived his entire life looking for pearls, but this one pearl is so crazy amazing that he's willing to do this. And, and I want to just challenge you with this. Are you living a life that Crazy. Where you know where you're going, what you're aiming at, what you're doing, that you are willing to, once you find it, freak out and get it. That's good. That's good. Thank you. And I think it is good. Because I read that and I was like, wait a second here. What is going on? And I thought about it. And this is what's going on. And let me ask you three questions. What is your pearl? What's your pearl? So, what's, is there a song about that? I just had a little melody in my mind. What's your pearl? If you say pearl too many times, it loses its definition. It's like pearl, pearl, pearl. It's like lost its meaning in my head. Does anybody ever happen to that to you? Right now, I don't even know what pearl means. It means nothing. It's just a pearl. What's your pearl? <laughs> Second question, what are your values? Third question, what is your bullseye? What's your pearl? What's your values? What's your bullseye? This merchant was, all he was doing was looking for pearls, and he finally found it. How cool is it, though? He found it. Now, I told you what my values were. I've challenged you. I've challenged you to figure out, just do three. Because you do more than that, you can't, you can't do it. <laughs> like, if you get home and you've got, like, 25 values, you will never, ever do all that. You can't. Okay? So three, I challenge you with three. Because you'll spend your entire life just trying to do it. Like, integrity alone is big enough to where you could spend your whole life trying to go after that. Trust me. Okay? So figure it out. Now, I'm going to explain to you tonight where your values come from so that you're not confused when you go home. And you're not concerned that your values isn't the same as Rick Warren's. Because he's like, oh, he's such a man of God. I better, figure, I better have the same as Rick Warren. Because if I do what he's doing, I'd be successful. That's not it at all. 
your values. They, they come from your life. They come from who you are. They come from the inside of you. They come from your experiences and, and, and everything that you've ever done. And it all comes and it all collides. And who you are comes out. And so you can't, you can't mimic or, or, or copy somebody else. It's, it's, it's everything that you've ever experienced comes out in who your, what your values are. And this is how your values come by. Three ways. The first way is by God's voice. God's voice. And if you've ever heard God speak to you, it changes you. And, 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 it, and, it, and when God speaks to you, you're like, whoo. And I remember when I was 15 years old and I was at the altar and I was just praying and I was worshiping God. It was a, such a simple altar call, just like the simple gospel. And I was just up there and I was just praying. And I said, Lord, what do you want with my life? Because I was 15 years old and who knows what they're going to do with their life when they're 15. You're going to be a professional athlete or, you know, Beyonce. So, I'm up there, and I didn't know what to do, you know, Beyonce or an athlete. And so I'm praying to God, <laughs> and, I'm, and I just hear God speak to me, you're going to go into full-time ministry. That's what he said. He said full-time ministry. And it was, as soon as he said that, I knew exactly what to do with my life. And, and, and so a value came out of that. A pearl. I started chasing a pearl. And so you can get your values when God speaks to you. You can get it that way. And you know what else God has told me to do? God's, God's spoken to me only a few times in life, okay? Only a few times. You know, I don't really trust people who feel like God's talk, spoken to them like every single day to do something with their life. I don't really trust that. Because God's only spoken to me like a few times, and he's, I'm still trying to accomplish the first time he spoke to me. Right? I'm still trying to do that. I'm still trying to accomplish what he's taught me to do. And, but he's, he called me into ministry. I remember God told me to marry my wife, Jen. And God told me to work with young adults. Can you believe that? God spoke to me those three things. Those are my pearls. Those are the things I'm going after. And, and those, those values, all those things, some of those things. So you'll get a value when God speaks. You'll get it. You'll get something. A second way that you'll get a value in your life is through amazing, life-changing experiences. Write that down. Amazing, life-changing experiences. Amazing, life-changing experiences. It's like when somebody goes on the mission field for the first time, and it's an amazing, life-changing experience. And they feel like this is what I want to do now for the rest of my life, right? This, you can pull values out of these things. When I was, I had never in my life, this is interesting, when I went to college, I had never heard of a college ministry. I had never heard of a young adult ministry before. 2003, yo. Never heard of it. Never experienced it, didn't know it even existed. But I was at college, and I was walking around campus, and this cute girl, sorry, Jen, we weren't even dating at the time. Sorry, I was looking at other girls. <laughs> and uh, she's watching on live stream because her kids are sick. Hi, babe. You're my pearl. <laughs> and, uh, and this cute girl's like, hands me uh, a flyer, to a ministry, and the ministry was called Sub 30. I was like, Sub 30? She's like, yeah, it's a great, it's a great uh, ministry at our church. I was like, what Sub 30 about? I was like, is that the, you know, the decibels you run on your volume? You know? <laughs> I'm confused. You're like, subs? You're like, subwoofers? And she's like, no, it's, it's, it's people under the age of 30, but above age 18. I was like, so 18 and 29? She's like, yeah. I was like, this is a church? <laughs> you know, it took a while. You know, I'm kind of thick, you know. And uh, she's like, this is just a service for 18 to 29-year-olds. I was like, that exists? Whoa, this is cool. So I'm excited that she's cute and that she's talking to me. And so I decided to go to this church service. But I don't want to go along, so I bring some friends. And when, so this point is amazing, life-changing experiences. And I walk into this place. And, and I, we were a little late. And the first song of worship is happening, and there were hundreds of 18 and 29-year-olds 
passionately worshiping Jesus. And it was, to me, an amazing, life-changing experience. I saw it with my eyes, and I didn't even know it was possible. But I saw something with my eyes, and in my heart leapt for it. My heart wanted it. I didn't want to be an attender. I wanted to be a leader of it, you see. I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it. This, this guy's leading worship. I wanted to be leading worship. This guy came up, this different guy came up to preach. I wanted to be the one preaching. It was in me. It, it, it took over me. And I went every single week. I went to sub 30 all the time. Amazing life-changing experiences. I think about another amazing life-changing experience that happened to me. When our first child was born, and, and after she was born, they, they realized something was wrong with her, and they took blood, and it turned out she had Down syndrome. So my first child was born. I got three kids now. My first child was born, diagnosed with Down syndrome, and, and, and everything changed when that happened. Now I have this huge heart for special needs kids. It's crazy big, and, and I value them. And I applaud them, and I try to champion them, and I, I come against anybody who's against them. Because our society wants to get rid of special needs kids. Our society thinks it's trying to eliminate, it's trying to eliminate special needs. And, and, and I value them, and I want to be around them, and I love them so much. But this amazing, life-changing experience set me in a path, on a path, okay? So this is our amazing, life-changing experience, and the last way that your values come by. And so I want you to think about your life. What has God spoken to you? What are some of the amazing life-changing experiences that you have been a part of? And the third way that, that your values will come is this. I call it intense failure. <laughs> Real intense failure. And I'll, can I share some of my intense failures with you? So here's some of my intense failures. When I was in middle school, I was a druggie. I was doing drugs all the time. And, and I was doing any drug I could find as long as I wasn't paying for it. And I got into this, and I got, became a part of this. And I didn't care, alcohol, liquor, beer. I was drinking it, smoking it, e eating it. Didn't matter. I wanted it, and it became a part of me. And you I'm a pastor's kid. I'm going to the church. I'm living a double life. I'm, I'm a Christian at home and at church, and I am a heathen on the streets, my friend. And I, was li and I was living an anxious, confused life, and my dad caught me smoking weed. And this intense failure in my life just turned something around in me. It turned something around in me. And still to this day, never went back to that lifestyle, never even came close to going back to that lifestyle. I abandoned all those nasty, negative relationships. I ran after God, and it set my life in a completely different direction, this intense failure, okay? Another intense failure that I had in life was when I was in high school, and when I dated girls, it was a failure, a massive failure, I couldn't, I was a failure at every turn when it came to girls. When, I, when we were just friends, it was a failure. When we were dating, it was a failure. When we broke up, it was a failure. There was no friends after breaking up. Everything failed that I tried with the opposite sex. Everything. And, and through these intense failures, I truly learned what a kind of woman I wanted in my life and the kind of relationship that I wanted. You know, I hate the fact that sometimes it takes failure to get us going down the right road. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. But not all the time. Not all the time. But sometimes. And God is so gracious and God is so good that these intense failures that you are embarrassed about, that you are ashamed about, that you don't want to tell anybody about, these things, once you get distance and time apart from that failure, you actually realize, ah, I've learned and I've grown and, and I'm, I'm, I'm better now. And you can actually get some distance between your failures and instead of being ashamed, you can actually become empowered by them. 
You really can. You really can. And you know, I've had ministry failures. It's true. I've done things the wrong way. I've said the wrong thing. I counsel, I give bad counsel. You know, I've had meetings with parents where they yelled at me with the way I treated their child's sin. It's happened. I mean, I've been yelled at. I've been ridiculed. I've been fired. Yeah, every time somebody leaves because they don't like me, they fire me. I fire you as my pastor. I've been fired many times, hundreds of times maybe. There's failures along the way. There's ministry failures along the way. But am I going to just say, oh, woe is me, tear my shirt and just not move on? No, 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 no. You fail forward. And you say, okay, I might have done it bad this time, but I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. So you can learn from these things. You know, I feel like, I feel like we, we all need to, to be able to pull that arrow back and, and launch it at the right target in life. We do. And so I challenge you tonight, before you go to sleep, what are your three values? And then I give you another challenge. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm giving you homework. If it's, like, it's not like you don't have enough, right? But I give you one more thing. Along with your value, get a verse. Get a scripture verse for your life. Now, I showed you, I showed you the momentums, things that we're going after, goals and, and progress that we're trying to make. Now, I'll show you momentum's verse. And this verse keeps us aimed in the right direction. And we say this verse all the time. And you probably have it memorized by now. It's John 10, 10. I love this verse so much. Listen to what it says. It says, Jesus came. I'm sorry. It says, a thief is only there to steal, kill, and destroy, but I can. That's Jesus came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they've ever dreamed of. And so when we come to church on Tuesday night, my goal, my goal for you is that when you leave this place, that you have real and eternal life, more and better life than you've ever dreamed of. When you leave this place, I want you to feel full of life. I want you to feel like you're on cloud nine. I want you to forget about your problems. I want you to forget about your mistakes. I want you to forget about your failures. I want you to see Jesus, and I want you to walk out of this place realizing it's going to be okay, and more than that, it's going to be amazing because the Bible tells me it's going to be better than I've ever dreamed of, and I want to tell you right now, you can dream some pretty cool stuff. But the Bible says it wants, Jesus wants it better than that for you. Better than that for you. And we do a lot of things to make that happen. But I want to, this is our verse, this is what we do. But here's the, what's your bullseye? What's your bullseye? Don't just make decisions on a whim. Don't just make big decisions without figuring out, sheesh, is this really one of my core values? You know, don't marry that person unless it lines up with your core values. Don't, don't choose a, a degree. Don't run after a certain degree if it doesn't line up with your core, with your core values. You know, we are, you're at a pivotal point in your life. And just say lots of decisions to be made, lots of things to be done, transition like crazy at this age. Am, am, am I aiming at my target? But you can hit it. You can hit it. It's not elusive, and it's not, it's not just disappearing. It is there. You can find it, and you can hit it. You can do it. Amen? Let's stand to our feet tonight. I want to worship with you just a song. Let's just worship tonight. Let's just forget about our problems, forget about our failures, Forget about what we got to do tomorrow. Forget about what you got to do tonight. Forget about who's not here. Forget about who is here. Because now is where Jesus wants to meet with you. And, and, and I want you to worship tonight. I want you to just set your eyes on Jesus. The one who came to give you real and eternal life. More and better life than you've ever dreamed of.
and you can dream some pretty cool stuff. That's the Jesus we serve. Isn't that awesome? So let's worship. Let's worship. One song. Here we go.